Meg Wallitzer's Fantastic, The Interestings, is most definitely the book of the moment. Her previous books, she has nine novels for adults, include The Wife, The Position, The Ten-Year Nap, The Uncoupling, and her first novel, written while she was an undergraduate at Brown, Sleepwalking, uh, which was published the year after she graduated and recently re-released and also for sale out there. Uh, themes involving relationships, men and women, ambition, sex, families, and friendship are currents throughout her body of work. But The Interestings is her broadest novel to scope uh, to date. It's the sort of book that stays with you after you finish reading it. And you know that delicious feeling when you read a novel and you walk around and those characters are alive and you want to be in it. Um, and once you read it, you also want to keep talking about it, uh, whether it's the characters or it's the themes or um, it's, it's Meg Wallitzer herself, um, who wrote an excellent essay for the New York Times addressing the rules of literary fiction between men and women while she was writing this book herself. Here this evening to get the conversation off the ground is author Molly Antipal, a former Stegner Fellow and currently Jones Lecturer at Stanford University. She's the author of the wonderful new story collection, The Un-Americans, which was selected for the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award. Please join me in welcoming Meg Wallitzer and Molly Antipal to the JCCSF. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear it? Can you hear me? Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. And, um, and thank you, Meg, for coming out tonight. Um, I've been an admirer of your books for so long, and it's just really wonderful to get the chance to talk to you tonight about them and about the interestings, which I genuinely, deeply loved. Thank you, and I um, loved your book, too. Oh, thank you. The Mutual so, Admiration yes, Society yes. begins. So, <laughs> and all of you who will write books, I will love them all. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so what we'll do tonight is, um, if it's okay with Meg, I'd love if she would um, read, read briefly, and then we can we can talk, and then we'll open it up for a discussion with the audience. Sure. So, um, great. Just a little. Uh, this will be kind of a really concentrated version of the opening, kind of like a little bouillon cube version of the opening of the interestings. Uh, it's set. Uh, the beginning is set at a summer camp in 1974. So I guess I should ask, how many people here went to summer camp? Oh my God, it's like, <laughs> but for those of you who didn't, you don't have to feel left out because the book follows for almost 40 years as the characters enter middle age and become disappointed. So how many people here have entered middle age and feel disappointed? Oh, now everybody can relate, everybody can relate. That's wonderful. So I'm just gonna read a little taste of the beginning. On a warm night in early July of that long evaporated year, the interestings gathered for the very first time. They were only 15, 16, and they began to call themselves the name with tentative irony. Julie Jacobson, an outsider and possibly even a freak, had been invited in for obscure reasons, and now she sat in a corner on the unswept floor and attempted to position herself so she would appear unobtrusive yet not pathetic, which was a difficult balance. It had been miraculous when Ash Wolf had nodded to her earlier in the night at the row of sinks and asked if she wanted to come join her and some of the others later. Some of the others, even that wording was thrilling. Sure, Julie had said out of instinct. What if she'd said no? What if she'd turned down the lightly flung invitation and went about her life, thudding obliviously along like a drunk person, a blind person, a moron, someone who thinks that the small packet of happiness that she carries is enough? Yet, having said sure at the sinks in the girls' bathroom, here she was now planted in the corner of this unfamiliar, ironic world. Irony was new to her and tasted oddly good, like a previously unavailable summer fruit. Soon she and the rest of them would be ironic much of the time, unable to answer an innocent question without giving their words a snide little adjustment. Fairly soon after that, the snideness would soften, the irony would be mixed in with seriousness, and the years would shorten and fly. Then it wouldn't be long before they all found themselves shocked and sad to be fully grown into their thicker, finalized adult selves with almost no chance for reinvention. That night, though, long before the shock and the sadness and the permanence, as they sat in boys' TP3, their clothes bakery sweet from the very last washer-dryer loads at home, Ash Wolf said, every summer we sit here like this. We should call ourselves something. Why, said Goodman, her brother, so the world can know just how unbelievably interesting we are? We could be called the unbelievably interesting ones, said Ethan Figman. How's that? 
The interesting, said Ash, that works. So it was decided. From this day forward, because we are clearly the most interesting people who ever fucking lived, said Ethan, <laughs> let, uh, let us be known as the interestings and let everyone who meets us fall down dead in our path from just how fucking interesting we are. The name was ironic and the improvisational christening was jokily pretentious, but still, Julie thought, they were interesting. These teenagers around her, all of them from New York City, were like royalty and French movie stars with a touch of something papal. I'll stop there, actually. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Sure. It's great. I hadn't heard you read from it, so it's, oh, yeah. yeah. It's always weird when you hear a writer reading. It's like they have to read, a, if you've heard writers, I think they put out, they recently released on tape um, writers from the past reading these early uh, recordings of people like Sylvia Plath. Huh. And it's so interesting when they don't have the voice that you thought they'd have. Right. It's like, go back and re-record that. Right. <laughs> I want you to sound the way you're supposed to sound. You know, I was, I was thinking as you read, um, something that I just loved so much about that section and also about the book in general is just how expansive and how sweeping it feels. And it's, you know, it's, it's moving, the book is moving through decades and it um, goes seamlessly through so many different points of view. And it also does this thing that I, that I loved so much in, in the very nonlinear structure because it felt so true to life, the way that we'll just kind of move back to these key moments in our past and stay there and zip around that way. And I was just kind of curious if you'd set out for this book to have such a wide scope. You know, no, I mean, I knew I wanted to write about what happens to talent over time. Mm -hmm. I had been very affected by the Michael Apted films, if any of you saw the mm -hmm. Up film, Seven Up. Well, those of you who don't know it, um, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. No, those of you who don't know it, um, this British filmmaker started filming a group of British school children every seven years, and the most recent one is 56 Up, and you see what happens to people. Once you start doing that in a novel, it kind of has to be a long, expensive book. You mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, Content seeks form sometimes, and that's what happened to me. I realized that the more characters I had, I was sort of committing to this big thing. And I didn't know that when I started. You start off in this state of, well, every novel opens in a kind of, uh, it's like a, a grandiose project. Uh -huh. And you have this fantasy, grandiose fantasy of what it's going to be. But as you write it, it kind of goes through a funnel and you see what it really is. And for me, it had to grapple with time. It had to grapple with time. And I didn't know that I would move back and forth in time. But one thing I realized, and when I teach, I, I say this, is that I think the concept of the flashback is a little bit made up. Yeah. Because you're sitting here, and some of you might have already been thinking about something that happened to you in the past, or where you're going for dinner, or when you'll get out of here. Um, we're toggling back and forth in time. So that felt natural to me to do in a novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that makes so much sense. God, I didn't know that I didn't know that you were inspired by those films. I loved them. Oh, good. Yeah. And it was also amazing how dark so many of those stories became. Oh, yeah. Well, people's lives are not linear. You know, in a novel, yeah. we want them to be manageable and controlled. There was one girl in the film, Susan or Susie, and the movies are very much about class because the kids come, the, now the adults, come from different mm -hmm. classes in England, which is such a class-conscious country. And um, there was this girl, when she was young, she seemed very posh and very snooty, and she was like, I don't care for that. And then in 28 Up, I think, her father dies. And she changes, and she's softened, and we see how experiences that happen to people change them. And that was very affecting to me as a writer, to think that when you have a character, like on a sitcom, a character comes out, and if you know them, like I remember watching the Mary Tyler Moore show, one of my favorite things ever, mm -hmm. when Ted Baxter would come out, you'd laugh anticipatorily, mm -hmm. because you know what the kind of thing he would say. Well, that shouldn't exactly happen in a novel. Right. Because there's more possibility of what people do that surprises us, pe that surprise us in life. And I think that's true in fiction. Right. Um, you know, and I, I kept thinking about these ideas of, you know, of class and, and privilege and how they're in relation to, relation to the artistic process in your book. So, you know, I was thinking about, you know, we have Jules Jacobson who doesn't come from a fancy background and is, you know, is genuinely funny, but has to give up her, you know, her ambitions of acting, you know, because she needs a, a stable job. And then yeah. her friend Ash, who, you know, has the safety net to fall back on so she can kind of fumble her way through you know, through her own aspirations and, and you know, and, and, and do all these things to try to become a director. And I was curious that those 
those qualities in these characters felt so essential to them as characters. And I wondered, did you know that before you started the book, that this would be a part of their makeup? Or did it just emerge as you were writing? It all just kind of emerges. I mean, I knew, what I knew is that the character of Jules, who you heard a little bit about, I mean, she goes to this summer camp knowing nothing about anything, and she meets this group of kids and wants to be with them and w knows that they are her cohort. And in a sense, for me, the novel is about that moment when you find your tribe. And even if you're not like them, you want to make them your tribe. And mm -hmm. I, when I went to the summer camp that summer, I, a great tip for those of you writing novels, make all the characters your age so that you don't have to worry about the math, getting huh. it wrong. <laughs> it's a really great thing to do. Um, it's a little limiting, but it's okay. Um, I went to this camp and I came from the suburbs and I met these kids from New York City. And I started carrying books around with the titles facing out so everybody could see it said like, the magic mountain, you know, so I'd <coughs> hold it so people could see what I was reading. I wanted to be a little pretentious and I became that way because I saw that in them. But they were talented and expressive. Um, that moment is something I wanted to capture. So that mm -hmm. was really the kind of the, the flame. There always has to be something that you light a flame under it. Like you only write about what you care about or what you're preoccupied by. Although I have this feeling that it's sort of people say, well, how do I know what I'm preoccupied by? There's one great way to know what you're preoccupied by. Um, look at everything you've Googled for the past 24 hours. You will know yourself. It's terrifying. For me, it would be half like Rilke and does this mole look suspicious? Um, right. But I... <laughs> so I had thought so much about that summer and how it changed me. But that's like, okay, if I'd written that as a novel, it would be kind of a teen novel uh -huh. in some way. And that wasn't what I wanted to write. How would it changed me, but then how it stayed with me as the moment when I felt I wanted to do something expressive and I wanted to find people who excited me and once you feel that way whether you're in the arts or whatever it is you can't really go back you know you can't go back well you go back and then it seems inadequate and you're rude to your parents you know I'm sure I walked around you know I was insufferable when I came home that summer talking in an English accent um, <laughs> I was in plays I was very the, the character in the book Jules is uh, well she's called Julie and her, her name is changed to Jules that first night. Mm -hmm. um, and I was excited when I came up with that because, yeah. you know, my name wasn't changed, but I was changed. Um, I was in these plays and I was terrible. I used to use that voice, like in every play I was in at the camp, that, Mother, where are you? Like that <laughs> Catherine Hepburn voice. It's sort of the equivalent of the poetry voice. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> I come into the room, the oranges are on the table. You know, I don't know where they get that. Once you, but I, I knew, to answer, I will answer your question. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, things emerge. Char some people feel that character is a way in. I mean, novels mm -hmm. are like advent calendars. There are a lot of doors you can enter to get to a novel. But for me, writing about talent, if you have an idea of talent, it needs to be embodied by people almost immediately. Right. Otherwise you're speaking in these generalities and you don't want to do that. So almost immediately this character, Ethan Figman, mm -hmm. who I loved, who is this boy who is an animator as a boy and he's very homely and he grows up to have a kind of hit TV show based on his animation that he did as a child. And it's like a Simpsons-like big show. Like I just loved him so much. Yeah. Like I have a blow up doll of him at home. I mean, I <laughs> really loved him. and. Uh, <laughs> He became the representation, I'm sorry, I don't, where does she say, why does she say these things? Um, he became the embodiment of some of the ideas. Hmm. You know, I, I so making embodiment of ideas, I guess, is something that we do as fiction writers. Uh -huh. I, I was quoting recently to some students this great line of Flannery O'Connor's in one of the essays in Mystery at Manners about the story Good Country People. Mm -hmm. And she talks about, so the daughter in that story has um, a wooden leg. And the daughter doesn't see her own, she hates her mother, who she thinks is ignorant. And the daughter is very intellectually superior. But the wooden leg, a, a Bible salesman comes and gets the girl up into a like hayloft and steals her wooden leg. And people were asking Flannery O'Connor about the wooden leg as a symbol. And she says, yes, but before it became a symbol, 
it had to be a leg. Uh -huh. And I think that that's true. Before I could use Ethan to describe talent, he had to be a fully embodied character. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of how it goes. The characters appear when you need them. Right. Don't you feel that way with your work? I do feel that way. Yeah, it has to. Whenever I, um, whenever I start with an idea, not with character, that's just when it kind of falls flat. Yeah. Or I think it's maybe me being clever, and I can feel that. Right. Yeah, it has to come from the character. Like if you're going to write a book about existential dread, somebody has to appear wearing a beret in about five <laughs> minutes. Um. So, so with this with this exploration of of talent, I just I. It, it's, it was so interesting to me because I kept thinking about how Jules so deeply values it. And then there's this this quote that I loved, and I just want to quote it. She has um, Jules's husband has no problem calling himself ordinary. And there's this this moment toward the end of the book when he says, "Specialness, everyone wants it. Most people aren't talented. So what are they supposed to do? Kill themselves?" Yeah. And and it was just like such a it was such an incredible moment for me when I was first reading the book and just thinking about how as a culture we almost fetishize specialness and just oh, what yeah. that does on a very long term. And I thought what was so, one of the things that was so interesting about your book is that it has this really long term look at what it would do psychologically and emotionally. And, and I wonder if that was something that you had, had realized before you were writing or it was really through these six characters that, that that's how the exploration came to be. It's so strange. The minute after I finish writing a book, I almost forget having written it. Hmm. It's such an ordeal. I feel like I need, you know, it's like having a seizure and then you need to sleep for a long time. <laughs> I said to my editor, I don't remember writing it like the next day. She said, what? What are you talking about? But um, you're constantly finding ways in. You're mm -hmm. like constantly knocking on doors to find ways in to make these points without being didactic about them. And I think character is such a great vehicle for mm -hmm. that. Somebody said, and I never really know who it is, that what you remember of the novels you love isn't plot but character. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a real absolute way in. But uh, I, I just sort of do whatever I have to do, mm -hmm. you know? Um, now I've forgotten your question exactly. Can oh, I no, that's it? great. OK. And, and I, I guess along those lines, something I was thinking about with this book is that it's, it's such an intimate book and it's such an emotionally generous and character-based book, but you're also, you know, dealing with, you know, issue, like r these sort of big political topics like class and rape and AIDS. And, and I wonder if, basically I wonder how you're able to make those very political issues more intimate and personal. And if that's sort of a different thing than approaching these thematic ideas around talent and specialness. Well, because they're all seen through the character's experience. They're not put in there, at least my goal was not to put them in there to say, now the AIDS crisis. I mean, right. in particular about AIDS, I will say, I feel that for people who are younger than me, who live in New York, they don't know what, or live here, they don't know what it was like in the 80s, right? You know, I mean, those of you who are old enough to remember that, mm -hmm. um, it was so shocking to, have had that experience when cities were in states of terror and everyone w felt they were going to die if they were HIV positive. And then when things changed, when drugs came along and it could become a more chronic thing to have HIV, it was like a seam in the earth closed up and that hadn't happened. And I asked some young students if they were aware of that and they said no. So I felt that it was important to capture it, but not just to capture it like a social studies textbook, right. but to capture it through the experiences of these characters because they're vulnerable. We're all vulnerable to our era. You know, we are, we're part of our era. I feel like we're just flying through life and these things happen around us, but then they become part of us. Mm -hmm. And that is what I tried to show, the sort of push and pull of experience and person. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Were, any, were any of these characters really hard, like especially hard to write? Um, yeah, I mean, writing a book is a nightmare. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It's just like, it just doesn't end. It's like Fantasia. Like, it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. You know, you hand it in. You think it's done. And, you, you know, you're very cocky. You're like, oh, it's done. I hand it in. And your editor goes, oh, let's meet about it the next rewrite. I'm like, what? You know, but I handed it in. You know, um, it, there's just always more. It's like a bucket. It, it, re self, it replenishes and you need to do more. And I think that the more you do, though, the deeper it can become. Mm -hmm. And I love that about a book, yeah. too, because you find things that you think, what if I hadn't put that in? 
Or what if I'd stopped here and almost left this terrible thing in my book that I couldn't see until the mm -hmm. third rewrite? Um, I, uh, I, I think that one character, there's a storyline in the book of a character named Jonah who um, is, I don't know, have some of you read the book already? Okay, great. So Jonah, oh good, <laughs> they're raising hands too. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jonah is uh, a slightly secondary character, and he's the son of a famous folk singer, and he has a terrible secret uh, in his childhood. Music was stolen. He was drugged by a, an evil folk singer. You don't hear the words evil folk singer that often, <laughs> do you? <gasps> you know, right, like that Arlo Guthrie. <laughs> so Machiavellian. Um, but. When I first wrote his storyline, he actually was molested as a child. And my editor, we have these long lunches, and she sort of said, what is that story doing in here? And I liked it so much. And you know, it's like that Grace Paley line, the myth of the best love sentence, pluck it out. Mm -hmm. The thing you love the most, you're fighting for, you're fighting for, and finally you know that it doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. But I was very sad, I left the lunch and I walked around and I, I knew he was important and I didn't want to pluck him out, but I didn't know what he was there for yet. And I realized that he wasn't enhancing, in a sense, the mantra of the book, which is what happens to talent over time. Uh -huh. And it really needed to be not a story about having sort of in his innocence lost, but I mean, partly about that, but having feeling that his talent is taken away. And I switched it from that. And not only was that a better storyline, but it also helped further what I was trying, the meditations I was trying to make on those ideas of talent. So he was tough at first, also because he's a passive character. Mm -hmm. People get so mad about passive characters and mad about characters they don't love. And um, it's a challenge to write about someone who's kind of mild in mm -hmm. a way and to not have the imitative fallacy, you know, where then the book is like the mildest thing in the world, that a soporific. Um, mm -hmm. And I loved him and I wanted to show his gentleness but his his damage too so mm -hmm. that was that was tricky yeah. oh that's interesting and it's, it's interesting one of the things that i that i so loved about this book was how much they all loved each other yeah and even though there's so much there's so much envy in that group um there's just nothing kind of they're not nasty to one another no and I, so yeah oh good I'm, I'm glad i mean i feel like i don't know i reached a point in my life where like i don't have scenes with friends anymore, right. do you? I no. mean, it's like, those are done. Like, you wouldn't, you know, remember those days when, like, you'd answer the phone and someone would say, we need to talk? It's like, you know, I, no, I don't do that. <laughs> like, you know, if that happened now, I'd say, no, we don't. <laughs> no, we really don't, we really don't. Um, so these friends are there, you know, people who you meet at a certain point, like, like you know, you get to a point where, like, you, you can't, you don't want any more friends, but then you meet someone and you love them and then you mm -hmm. have to let them on the bus, right? Um, these friends got in there early and I think there's something about meeting your tribe at that age that's so special so that you, you can afford, there's a lot of elasticity for the kind of people you can become while still maintaining this thing. But the notion of the group is interesting. I mean, the, I had no group really of friends when I was young. I mean, I. And one thing they don't tell you, they, whoever they are, um, is that your friendships in adulthood, you can go years not speaking to someone, but you love them still. And that, that was very sad to me to find that out, really. I thought that mm -hmm. life would be more like Sex in the City, where people go out in a group of four every weekend. You No, it doesn't work like that. I mean, unless it does for you. No, um, no. It's also who has children and who doesn't. Who has children and who doesn't and what hap where you are geographically mm -hmm. is another thing. So um, I like that idea of, of characters who can go a long time without seeing each other, but they do have this love and there's no way that that will ever be taken away. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, platonic friendships between like Ethan and Jules uh, was important to write about too. I mean, where they love each other and there was something when they were young, but she wasn't attracted to him and he marries Ash and they still stay friends and uh, just the different kinds of friendship love I thought hadn't been written about in a way that I wanted to write about. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, I found after I finished the book that I, I was so happy when I met two friends for dinner and they had also read the book and I found that we were just talking about Ethan and Jules as if we knew them and as if these were you know people in our lives and just this idea of 
Yeah. What is what is it like to to not to, to decide that you don't love someone back and then you just see the way that he blossoms with someone else and that just yeah. seems so painful and true. Yeah, yeah, no, it was I love I just I did love writing it more than my other books, I have to mm-hmm. say, and I I think it was because it was so character based that I felt I thought about them all the time. Like I just thought I was so preoccupied thinking about them. Yeah. You know, I neglected my children, but <laughs> They didn't eat for days, but you know they really don't need that much nutritionally. Um, it, it's it's wrong what they say. <laughs> yeah, I, I had read in um, in an interview with you um, about, and I th- I've heard you talk about it a couple times in interviews. The importance of urgency when writing, yeah. and it was something that I was thinking a lot about too. Like basically figuring out why the reader should care about characters and why they should become absorbed in your story and your language and I just sort of I I wonder what that was like for you when you were writing like were there certain parts that you just had to chuck because they had no urgency or were there or how do you also just find that that sense of urgency when you're working you know Mary Gordon the great writer who was one of my earliest writing teachers said the best piece of advice that I've kind of lived by which is or try to anyway, which is only write about what's important only Mm -hmm. and there's a parenthetical in there only write about what's important to you and you kind of can't go wrong because you really have to write about the things that, that worry you and you think about and you're trying to work out. Otherwise, you're picking something like from the headlines. Mm-hmm. And if you can't find the juncture of where you overlap with that thing, it's hard to, to say that this book is going to have urgency. Every book needs an imperative, a reason to be. I mean, we live in this era of so much text. There's so much prose scrolling before our eyes every day. The idea that your book should be something that people need to commit to when they you know, have to read everything all day. I mean, th- because of the internet, it changed everything. When I started writing novels, you know, I wrote my first books on a little Smith Corona with, a, with white out. I mean, it was <laughs> like the craft that went into that. It was like doing scrimshaw, you know. Um, <laughs> needlepoint and uh, <laughs> now there's this ocean of print in our day so to commit to a novel about characters who don't exist um, yeah. can feel the novel can feel like a folly unless you feel the imperative that the reader had and and uh, I, you know it's a good thing for fiction to do that because we live in a really non-fiction culture mm-hmm. where people feel that they need to know what's true, they want to know what's true, but I think the fiction writers I know, the books that they write, I mean, they feel true. It's like, it's not Mm -hmm. what happened, but it could have happened, and that should be just as important, because it's the writer working out something that is true. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was that study done about how people who read fiction had a greater capacity for empathy. Mm -hmm. We all knew that, right? We just didn't have the hard facts about it, but, Mm -hmm. but we knew it had to be true. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, I was also thinking along those lines about the way that um, gender and sexual politics are just played out in all of your books and also here. And, um, you know, the essay that you wrote for The Times in, in The Second Shelf in 2012 was such an important essay for me and I imagine for a lot of people in the room um, about the role of, of gender in fiction. And I wonder with, like, that those particular issues if you find yourself if you're kind of aware that you're addressing these issues in your books or if they're just such a large part of you that they just sort of emerge naturally they kind of emerge naturally it started for me I can say the sea change started with a book I wrote called The Wife Mm -hmm. and actually it's really weird I realized that this is just an oddity but starting with The Wife all of my books had were the books and before that they weren't and it was like I was trying to work out something about an issue, and the wife was about sexual politics and about gender and female complicity with male power, and it was the wife. It was not, you know, mm-hmm. wife, you know, or a lot of gerund books were out when in the 80s, like, you know, I, <laughs> running in place or something like that. It was, it was the book, the position. I was working out the the as though it's the only book, it's the wife. But that's kind of what you have to feel when you're writing. And once I wrote that book, it's like I, I thought, oh, that's interesting to, to start with an idea. Yeah. And starting with an idea felt more natural to me because I would sort of maybe bury the ideas under a lot of stuff before. I was a little bit afraid to do it. I'm, I'm sort of timid in those ways. And then I got a little bit bolder. And uh, it, it, 
to think about the ideas, but not in a kind of like you're writing a dissertation, of mm -hmm. course, but because you know that the characters are going to kind of soon follow you once mm -hmm. the ideas come out. I, um, yeah, writing that essay was, was helpful. I was writing the book, as Stephanie said, while, you know, I was writing the essay. And one of the things that I talked about was book covers. And I actually just wanted to say one little side note about that. So, you know, the cover of my book, my editor um, marched my essay, which deals with book covers and how sometimes the book covers by men look different from book covers by women. That you could, a lot of covers of books by women would have like, a little girl in a field of wheat, or then I realized after the essay, my personal favorite, Women in Water, um, <laughs> and covers by men often had big, bold typeface. Mm -hmm. And so my editor marched my essay down the hall to the art department, and then they came up with this, with you know, big, bold typeface. But it, but it's not just a gender, new, gender neutral cover. I feel that a cover should be sort of inviting and mm -hmm. make you want to open it and not exclude a gender or other. And as a result, actually, they weirdly made. Um, a tote bag <laughs> out of my cover. I mean, really, like, what writers have had that? Did Ernest Hemingway have that? <laughs> was, there, was there a farewell to arms fanny pack? I think not. Um, so that was a fringe benefit of having written that essay. <laughs> it looks like a Rothko painting. I know, it's very beautiful. I feel very, very pleased with, with that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, and also the knee, there are so many things, like the, the girl's knees is a big thing on the cover. Or the backs of women's necks. Yeah, yeah. What is that about? Like, turn around, lady. <laughs> no. You know, like, what? <laughs> Look me in the eye. So, yeah, I, I absolutely <laughs> agree. I thought about that a lot, too. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's strange. Um, but thinking about the, you know what, it always helps. Like, when I was writing that essay and thinking about all of these mm -hmm. different things about, um, gender and subtle things too. Books, you want your books to be subtle and you want to make points without making points, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's just, I don't know, for me it was just that advent calendar metaphor that I'm gonna endlessly beat here. Um, it was a good way in to think about what bothered me and what I thought about over time. Right. To just sort of say, see, because for a long time I think the way I was writing fiction was that there were these things that I thought about and that bothered me and troubled me or interested me. And then there was my fiction. Mm -hmm. And they were these two separate tracks. And if you start writing fiction and you're seen as a lyrical writer and people circle your lines, I love that image. For me, it was always about like blue TV screen light, you know, and stuff that you know that you can do with your eyes closed, you start mm -hmm. doing it with your eyes closed. And you want your eyes open and you don't want that to be the case. So I then realized it was like such an obvious thing for a lot of writers, but you should marry the two ideas of what you're preoccupied with and angry about or worried about with the fiction you're writing. Yeah. And then I think my fiction got better. Mm -hmm. But what am I not doing now that could make my fiction even better? I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. <laughs> Well, so I was thinking about while you were examining all of these, like all, all of these ideas in that essay and then writing this book yeah. and something else I was thinking about in that, that you had this, um, this quote that I loved and that I thought a lot about afterward about how you, you wondered if, um, you know, there were all of these sort of big sprawling expansive novels by men and then there were these kind of smaller trimmer books by women and you were wondering if it might have to do with trying to please book clubs and being edited in a certain way. And so then it was this this moment of um, of getting the interestings and here's this thick spine and right. here's, you know, a 550 page book and, and, and I wonder what that was like for you. Like was it a totally different editing and drafting process than, than any of your other books? Not really. I mean books are, you know, the Wife was a really short book, uh -huh. and, and one of the big edits on it really involved taking out stuff. Huh. And here, um, you have to have the discipline, I guess, to know the right length and, and what needs to be done, to sort of be brave enough to know what needs to be done, even when you think you're finished, the next revision is sometimes, I, I, I often think to myself and say to students, radicalize your work, mm -hmm. radicalize your work. Like you could be writing a novel, the, the problem with writing a novel is that you reach a certain point at which you get into the kind of soft middle, the fondant, right? <laughs> Inside the chocolate, and, and, but it's not good, it's just, just flabby. And then you still have to carry it around, it's like yours. You know, it's like the little image of like the hobo stick 
you know, with the kerchief on it. Like this is this thing you have to carry around. It's your book, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a moment when you can change that book and you can do something new with it. And I think that's the moment that things really, really change in a novel. So for me with the interestings, when I realized it was becoming long and I started to see, oh my God, like I'm <laughs> having written this thing in which I talk, like I talk about, you know, big baggy novels by men. I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing, now that you can look at word count. That was a good thing about Smith Coronas. They didn't have a word <laughs> count. Oh my God, word count. It was like, what am I dreaming? It was so long to say rather than to trim it and make it this shapely thing. But you know, some of my favorite novels I would consider really shapely, like the novel Mrs. Bridge by Evan S. Cannell, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, like, right, like it's the greatest fabulous novel and it's quite short and parts of it feel really kind of epigrammatic. Um, it, it's all about economy and it's powerful and funny and sad and all of those things. Whereas a long novel that you, I realized that the pleasure of writing this for me was about letting it go into different directions. Mm. And once I knew that and I accepted it, I think I made my peace with that and I let it go further. So the process was just sort of allowing the inevitable to happen. Uh -huh. And that's something that we, we chafe against it. We want, because of the grandiose fantasy of what the novel is. You think of a novel as a certain length that occupies only a certain amount of people's times. It won't frighten book clubs, mm -hmm. you know? But what if it's not that? And what if it has things in it that are disturbing to even you? Things you don't want your friends to read even, you know? I mean, I, I often say, if not now, when? Like, you, this is it. This mm -hmm. is your chance to write. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the process. And with this, like, holding, holding this many decades of story and, you know, in so many different points of view in your head, how did you know, or, or did you have rules for yourself about when to go into certain points of view? Were you just following whoever was in the most like complicated place in that moment? Um, I, I have a, a way that I write, which is I write 80 pages without worrying about anything. I think this is a really useful way to write for, for me anyway. Write 80 pages without worrying that anybody's gonna see it or what it's even about, mm -hmm. and then take it out, look at it, you know, mark it up, see what you've got, see horrible things in it that you can take out that you can't believe you almost put in. Um, see what you have, and at that point I would make an outline mm -hmm. because I had so many characters. So I would really make an outline, but not like a regular outline of plot, but it would be more like show her envy here. Hmm. You know, I mean, I was always so bad at structure as a kid, like when we had to do outlines for school, I would write the Greeks, A, what they wore, two, what they ate. Like I didn't know what the point of an outline was. Even now to me, having an outline, it's not as if I referred to it all that often. It was kind of like having an EpiPen in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, you knew it was there. Um, and it helped me think about just some of the, the shifts that I would make among my characters, but I didn't even refer to it. I wrote it out, and in writing it out, I sort of understood it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Also, one thing actually that an outline really does help in terms of a book like this is how much sort of t page time you're giving your characters. Mm -hmm. Because that you want, you know, I mean, you don't want it to be even exactly, but you want to make sure you have not seen that character for a while and now you're back with them. But yeah, it's sometimes I I saw that something urgent had happened and I didn't want to leave it. Like, it's not supposed to be fair. I mean, it's not even. You, you would say, okay, now I'm going to stay with this character because it's interesting. So I'm going to stay here even mm -hmm. for the next chapter. Yeah. Yeah, I kept thinking about it. I think um, because I'm starting to to write a novel and so I was reading your book with a pen and just trying to figure out points of view and I was like wow I can't figure out the structure and that was really yeah. interesting to realize that it wasn't following a pattern and, no. and and also that there were certain essential characters in the book where we where you wouldn't go into their point of view no and that's sort of it's an unfair thing because two characters Ash we don't get her point of view Goodman we certainly don't get his point of view you're kind of you're it's slanted against them mm -hmm. because when people get a point of view in a novel they become, their humanity shows because we see why at least they thought that was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so that they have humanity. I mean, what they do isn't just unfamiliar to us. But when you don't give them that voice, we don't see it. But yeah. nobody ever said fiction writers were fair. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious, were there certain books that you were really turning to while you were writing this? 
Yes, I'm a big believer in reading a lot when you're writing, especially when you get to that soft middle and you're depressed by your work and mm. you're carrying around the hobo <laughs> stick full of crap <laughs> and you think, you know, why didn't I go to law school? Um, uh, I read the Edward St. Aubin, St. Uh, Patrick Melrose novels, mm -hmm. and which I just found electrifying. I loved them so much. And what I loved about them, in addition to just the, the brilliance and wit and the sadness of them, uh, was that it was such a big project of his. I love when I can see like that a writer was doing a big project. Mm -hmm. You know, like I believe in novel as diorama, you know, this idea that you're just working out something, oh, you know, even if it's kind of big, especially if it's big, and it, I don't even mean big in length, um, that was a very important book for me to read, and I, oh, I love the novel Old Filth by mm -hmm. Jane Gardam, that's, oh good, this is great, <laughs> guys, um, and uh, it's just not like anything else, and it followed over, you know, the century, novels that just sort of bring in the century, whatever century that may be, mm -hmm. almost like it sweeps it in with the characters, like leaves coming in from the outside when the door is open. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. So those were really important books to me, and I hope to read them again and again. And Mrs. Bridge is funny, too, because, you know, it's a really funny novel. And I think humor, actually, mm -hmm. is something that is very undervalued in literature in this country. We want our writers to be very somber on the page and really funny when they get up on stage, mm -hmm. and it's hard to be that way, you know? That Katsia, he's a laugh a minute. You know, it's <laughs> like, what? Ideally, they would be sort of part of one thing, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. I know it's true with everything with film. You just kind of see what, everything that wins the, you know, just the award-winning stuff, and it's just like, it just seems so hard to be funny, too. It is, and yet being funny. I, I mean, I, I, if you know, like when I, Think, when you think about what you want to put into your novel, there's this great line by Zadie Smith in an essay she wrote called Fail Better about mm -hmm, the novel. Mm -hmm. Do you know it? Oh, good. Um, she says, when I write, I'm trying to show my way of being in the world. And I love that line because, mm -hmm. again, like along with write about what's important, you're trying to show your way of being in the world. And if you have wit in you, but then you sit and write and you get very hushed, you have to ask yourself, why am I removing part of myself? I love mm -hmm. novels. I guess you know what it is about the Edward St. Aubin books. Um, you felt that, it, and I don't even mean this autobiographically, I know those books are autobiographical, at least but uh, what I've read, but um, you want to jump into a book. Mm -hmm. There's this moment when you want to just sort of be that, that sensibility, put more of yourself, that bullion cube version of yourself into mm -hmm. a book. So why would you leave out your wit, mm -hmm. because the culture might find it lightweight or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And you feel like the culture still does? Yeah. Yeah. The culture. The they, culture. they, um, the man. They're so bad, none of us here are bad. <laughs> we're, we're all good. Um, but I think so. I, I, think, I think humor in fiction in particular is, is like there's a tricky relationship, but there aren't that many funny novels that are really good. I mean, I think when the Finkler question won the Booker Prize, mm -hmm. that was a really big deal. Right. Because, I, I mean, I didn't love that book at all, but I, it felt sticky to me. Mm -hmm. But it was a big deal because it was a funny novel that had won the Booker Prize, and that was very unusual. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think it's a gendered thing also? Just as soon as you said it, I thought of all of these men who were yeah, Phil lauded Roth, and funny. Right. right. Yeah, I think it might be a gender thing, absolutely. Hmm, idea for a new essay. Right. <laughs> Um, so just one last question and then we'll move it um, into your questions. I'm, I'm curious, what are the writers that you wish, w that, you, that you would just love to push on people, like people who aren't very well known, who, who you just think are wonderful? Um, well, well, really Jane Gardam is one and I mm -hmm. don't know that she's well known, she's a British writer. Uh, of course I'm going completely blank right now. Um, I'll, I'll think on that, but that's yeah. a really good one. Old Filth, if you haven't read Old Filth, it's really fantastic. Um, I love that book. So. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Sure. This was really fun. Sure. And, um, and now, I know a lot of you have questions. And if not, I have like 10, I have many okay. more. Here's one. We'll okay. start over here to your guys, right? I, I loved your book. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the chronology of it, if, if there was ever a moment where you wanted to do 70s, 80s, 90s, or if you knew you would skip back and forth. 
Yeah, no, I didn't want to stay in a strict chronological order at all. Um, I figure I wanted to take my time with with some of the different eras, but it, but once you start, the problem also is if you do 70s, 80s, 90s, it seems as if the point of the book is to show these eras, and, and that wasn't the point of the book. So I wanted that just to kind of, it's like part of the batter, it's folded in with it, but no, I, I, I was happy to move back and forth in time. Because if you know the characters, you know, whether I wrote about them when they were 15 or 50, I knew who they were. I just had to make sure I did get the facts right around them, but uh, no, I, I, I didn't want to be strict that way. Next, next question back here. Uh, so I came of age uh, during the Silver Palette and the Moosewood Cookbook, uh, oh, yeah. so very much felt comfortable with the book. Uh, it felt familiar to me. Uh, but I gave it to my 24-year-old son to read last week, um, and I was curious whether it would cross generations uh, and gender. And on my way here, I asked him what he was thinking about the book. He isn't quite finished. And he said kind of wistfully, doesn't Jules ever get happy with what's going on? Uh, yeah. That He said she seems, and it resonated me, with me when he said that, that not... In the moment, at the beginning, she might have been a little happy, but nothing ever seems quite good enough. Uh, and that she therefore, even though she's going through these experiences, doesn't seem satisfied with anything. And I, we were wondering why that, why that had to be. Because I think it's the way she is. And I realized that early on. And one of the things that, I don't know if you feel this way with your characters, Molly, but to allow characters to be annoying or not happy, it's hard because, you know, like as a parent, for instance, you want everybody to be happy and everything to work out. But as I got to know her, if she'd never met these other people and saw that, so the, these two couples have va vastly different lives. Jules, who starts off as this actress at camp, becomes a social worker and marries Dennis, who's an ultrasound technician. And Ash and Ethan live this life so far beyond them as zillionaires. And these two couples are on these very, very different tracks. When I started out and came to New York, I was so naive. I thought that the, the playing field was level. I thought, you know, everybody, we'd all write our novels and we'd all be together, you know, in our groups of six and everything would be the same. And of course, people's lives, people fall away. You know, you have friends, you don't know what happened to them. People who are the most talented people. I, when I went to camp, actually, that summer, there was a girl who was so good at acting and she was really brilliant at it. And I, in the way a child thinks, I thought, she, oh, she's going to become famous. And mm -hmm. uh, she didn't. And I recently saw... You know, I went online and, you know, basically you can go on Google and stalk people. I've heard tell. And um, I saw that, you know, she'd become a, a physician. And I thought, oh, that's right, because she must have had empathy when she was young. And she's probably using that as a doctor. And that's what happened there. But if you can't have the life you want, like she didn't have the life she wanted, this woman I knew when she was a girl, and Jules didn't have the life she wanted, sometimes people don't change. And in, I feel that in fiction, you know, you can tell writer, beginning writers everything has to change in a story. I think of it a little differently. I think that, no, it's not that it has to change, but there has to be a turn. I think there are a lot of turns in the novel, but unfortunately, I think for Jules, she, it, it's about degree. She's not as envious as she is later on, but I have a feeling, I have my thoughts about envy, really, and, and jealousy, the less you know, destructive of the two. Like, a friend can call you and tell you something wonderful that's happened to her, and you're genuinely happy for the friend. But sometimes, you're talking for a while, because we're made of ego, there's a moment when the ego sort of inserts itself into the room like a moose head mounted on a wall and says, my son didn't get into that college. You know, no, and we weren't talking about you. And I wanted to track some of those things, those intractable things that people have. But it was hard to let her be that way, but it felt right to me. It was just the way I thought she was. So tell him that, and I hope he finishes. <laughs> next, next question's back here. 
So Goodman and Kathy are two characters that we don't explore their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this conflict between them throughout the book. As you were writing the characters, did you have a point of view on that? Did you know what, what had actually happened? Or did you kind of just leave that open-ended? Well, you know, people write to me on Facebook and say, you can tell me what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody also wrote to me on Facebook and told me that, well, you can see now from this that people use e-readers, said to me, my book group read your book, but I have to tell you we found the first 30% really slow. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> here's, what, here's what happened with the Goodman, the, this is true, the Goodman and Kathy storyline um, was tricky. I, that's actually another thing mm -hmm. when you asked about characters who were difficult to write because we don't get the definitive version of what happened, like right. the lost episodes of what happened in your book. Um, I didn't really know in the beginning what I thought had happened. And there was a scene in the book where, so there's, there's a, an alleged sexual assault of Kathy by the character Goodman and we don't see that scene in the moment. So they both have a different view of what happened. And uh, so Jules goes out to a coffee shop with Kathy and Kathy is telling her how upset she is. And when I first wrote it, it was rather bland. And then I have Kathy biting her nails down to the quick and biting them almost in a feral way. And you know what? I felt like that th there was some something in that that you know it's that showing not telling thing. So I can't. I, I something happened between them, you know, and I felt satisfied with with it and seeing it through something visual in Kathy, rather than saying I know definitively what exactly happened. If that answers you. Um, Next question on this side. Two questions. One is, are the characters based on people that you actually went to the camp with? Or are they a conglomeration? Or did you create them? Um, they are not based on people I know. I never write, you know, it makes people mad at you. But I will say this, my best <laughs> friend in the world, who I half dedicated the book to, is someone I met that summer. And she physically resembles Ash. Mm -hmm. But after that summer, I mean, after just those initial, we never sat around in a group in a teepee. She's from Canada, not New York. She's nothing like those characters. So there's nothing like her beyond that. It was just this sort of image of her. Although, similar to something in the book, like we got these yearbooks and it's true that at the end of the summer, I was looking at hers not too long ago and like every boy had written, you know, I never told you this, but I was in love with you all summer. <laughs> and, in my, and in my yearbook, they wrote, you're so funny, you know. Like, <laughs> so no, they're not based on anybody beyond just, that, and, and question two. Uh, yeah, of all of those people that you identified here as going to summer camp, yeah. I'm wondering how many went to arts camps? Oh, not a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, no, I mean, I had been the summer before to this camp where it was like riflery and lanyards 24 seven. <laughs> and I knew that wasn't, you know, camps where you sing, make new friends, but keep the old. You know, we're doing Marat Saad at my camp the next summer, uh, which was much more up my alley, apparently. Uh. Okay, the last question oh, is, oh, of great. those people, That's gonna cost of those you. few people, how many went to Indian Hill? <gasps> oh, the Indian Hill people, hi. So, okay, I have to say, okay, so one of the nice things that happens when strangers write to you is they tell you they, they went to your camp even before you were there. So I went to this camp, which called itself a summer arts workshop, not a camp, but um, in the Berkshires, and it's long, long closed. And all these incredible people went there from the arts. Uh, Frank Rich went there. Um, I think I heard Julie Taymor went there. Hmm. Arlo, Arlo, what's that? Carly Simon, Arlo taught guitar, Arlo Guthrie. Not, you know, not too shabby. Um, and it was, it was the most extraordinary place because they let you take yourself seriously there. Didn't you feel that way about it? You know, so I, I will never stop thinking about it. I mean, when I didn't know I wanted to write this book for a very, very long time, and I said to my friend Martha from the summer, why didn't we know that this was an idea for me to 
you know, right, why didn't this occur to me? I had all these dreams about Indian Hill. Here's the funny thing, it was this beautiful, beautiful green and rolling camp in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, absolutely gorgeous grounds with a mansion out front. I had dreams over the years that I went back there, but it was a, a dirty camp site. It was like a pun in my dream, it was a camp site. But I didn't care because I was there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find a way to get back. It's like, oh, a book that I loved so much was Brideshead Revisited. Mm because that idea of the house and of the family, falling in love with a family is a very durable theme that is in this book as well. Mm -hmm. And the desire to return to a place, but you can't again, you can't go back, it, it looks different. Like when she goes back to the apartment of the Wolf family later and it, it's different, I find that so sad about life. It's like, I almost wanna just keep flying through life and not look back. But when you write a novel, you have to, you know? It forces you to do that. But it was a wonderful, wasn't it? Didn't you just love it? I mean, aren't you obsessed with it? <laughs> How, aren't you like really delayed like I am? Like, I mean. You did? It's like 40 or, 50, 40 or 50 years later, and I went back to see, where was that? And it's what condos you? now, it's lovely. No. And it's recognizable, well, but it's, it's now condos. I know that it's condos because uh, oh God, now I'm blocked. Somebody wrote me who's um, a movie director who went there and he was talking about it being condos and how we're all maybe like, when we're really, really old, we'll populate it, turn it into like an assisted living. <laughs> <laughs> so you like, it'll be like this perfect circularity. We started our life there, we end our life there. And we're gonna like say to the nurses, now we're gonna do a scene for you from Marat Saad. And they're gonna go, what, shut up, you know? <laughs> and I'm gonna put on that voice, the acting voice again. <laughs> I loved it, it, it just, we, we were allowed to take ourselves seriously, maybe more seriously than we should have been allowed to, but it was exciting, right? Even if you didn't become, I mean, I, in a weird, funny way, I sort of became a writer. Somebody had given me a diary not long before that summer, and I started it off in a very Bloomsbury way, like, you know, writing sort of like, 30th December, 1973, watched Bewitched today, you know. Um, <laughs> and I was like writing very, very diligently, you know, saw Vanessa Bell, watched Bewitched, you know. I'm writing very, very diligently. And then after a while, I got really bored with writing and stopped, and then I found the diary months later and I got, I felt very bad because for posterity, I better fill it in. So I wrote on every page, nothing happened, nothing happened, <laughs> <laughs> as though I had written in it for real. Um, Our next question over here to your right. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, being a fiction writer in the age of memoir. Um, when people, this is more people's reactions when they meet you. Um, I, I, you know, we, we feel we know you, all, all, all the writers that we read. Um, and we're so used to the idea of everything being autobiographical yeah. these days. How do you deal with that, if in fact you do it all? You know, I don't even, I don't know how you feel about this, Molly. I, I don't, of, of course things come from you. You know, they're not piped in from outer space. You know, everybody asks writers that boring question, where do you get your ideas? And then the writer says the snide thing, Cleveland and ha ha ha. But, <laughs> you know, it's a legitimate question because where do ideas come from? I mean, they're this stew of things that come from you, but they're sort of observational. They're like, I feel like we are, we're like giant, magnets walking around and filings go zip, zip, zip and attach themselves to us. And whatever attaches themselves to us, we put in our novels. And some of it is things that just interest us. Some of it is things that happen to us. Um, I don't really distinguish. I love, the fact that I'm a fiction writer is like, to me, it's like Wonder Woman's bracelets. I hide behind that. Especially when you have kids, you know, and I wrote a novel called uh, The Position about parents who write a joy of sex manual and what happens when their kids grow up, you know, which is like the, you have to be free to write about whatever you want and whether it happened to you or not, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. Like I'm not, I'm not interested, I'm much more interested in fiction, I think. I, I'm most interested in fiction as a form, I would say. So, I mean, a friend of mine who, who jokes about, um, certain inessential memoirs that have come along, like said, like came up with an idea for like what would be the least 
essential memoir that somebody could write, and here's what he came up with. It would be called My Son the Sous Chef. It's like that that is a book that did not need to be written. Um, I just I guess I don't fetishize whether something happened or not. I'm just not even interested in it. I love that it, it funneled through the writer and came out in some other way, like a Play-Doh mill, you know? Um, but yeah, we do live in an age of memoir, but I am really a novelist through and through, and I will never be anything else. So. Our next question, also on your right over. Hi, thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, um, sure. I'm here with a mini version of my book club, and we picked it as our book club book and we'll be discussing it in May. So I just wanted to turn it back to you and say what question would, would you recommend um, us giving to the book club about the book? Or if you're at our book club, what question would you ask of us who read it? Um, wow, I don't think I've ever been asked that. What question would I? Somebody wrote me recently, again, um, and said, would you answer these questions? You know, I'm like, sure. And then I looked at the questions and they were like, what will happen to Jules the following year? <laughs> and I wanted to say, like, it was so weird, like, I, because readers, and, I, and I'm this, when I'm a reader too, they can't accept the end. I'm, mm -hmm. But those of us who write novels, or at least our own novels, it's sort of like every novel is like the Truman Show, the end of the Truman Show, when you find the edge of the world, the world mm -hmm. ends there and the characters are kind of floating, you know, inside it. Um, so don't ask me about what will happen. <laughs> don't ask me about did, do they get the money at the end? Because people, again, you can tell me. Um, uh, boy, I don't, I'm, I don't know, Molly, do you? <laughs> that was a quick one. What, um, what would I? What would you want to say, talk about um, in the book? Well, the use of time is interesting to me, rather than even chronology, but time. See, because I just think time is so interesting. Aren't you amazed at how much time has passed mm -hmm. in your life? Like, I think about this constantly. Like, I saw somebody recently, and she said, how long has it been since we've seen each other? I said, three years. Of course, it was 10. <laughs> and then I felt really sad, and I realized that, that notion of the difference in time, like in childhood, long summers, I haven't had a long summer in so long. You know, I haven't had a long anything. Mm -hmm. I wanted to convey some of that through the characters. Like the, okay, so here's something, like the chapters are long. Um, oh, and can I, I'll say one thing, maybe, all right, here, ask them about this. Um, why was the ISBN number 742? <laughs> no, ask them, ask them about this. So when I first wrote the book, the first line currently, currently is, on a warm night in early July of that long evaporated year, the interestings gathered for the very first time. When I first wrote the book, the line was, on a warm night in early July of that year, the interestings gathered for the very first time. And it felt almost a little clinical. And when I put in long evaporated, it did two things. I was very excited. I did like the little Snoopy dance when you have a moment when you do something in a book that you like. Um, long evaporated established two things. It said that um, a lot of time was gonna pass and had passed since that year. So you already knew it was historical without saying, without having to do the thing that they do in movies, 1974, <laughs> Berlin, you know. Um, <laughs> or Stockbridge or wherever. Um, but Long Evaporated, for me, gave a feeling. Um, I like things that do double duty. It gave a wistful feeling. So it set you up in some emotional, it gave a valence to it. Uh, so maybe talk about the choices, wor particular words or lines, because I think they matter. They're not just pretty, but I think word choices, the choices that writers make, make the whole book feel completely different, even like two words in the first sentence. So I don't know, is that good? Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. I was just gonna ask about Yeah. I'm I'm actually also hosting a book club in May and debated whether to invite <laughs> my book club fellow book club members because most of them are in the East Bay. Um, and then I decided to just kind of cheat and come myself and get the inside scoop. Um, but just listening to you, I was gonna maybe we're a lot of good friends, about eight of us. I was gonna ask them based on what you said, um, and, and Jules in particular. Like, do you have the life you want? Like, what's great, what's missing? Because you were kind of saying that Jules maybe didn't quite have 
the life she wanted, but there are certainly wonderful things in her life, but also yeah. things that were missing. So I just, I mean, that's a pretty deep question requiring a lot of honesty, but certainly it's a group no, that can I handle think, that. Uh, yeah, the idea for me in this book, I realized, and again, this is one of the ones that I didn't know I was writing about. It's about what is a good enough life? Like, do you have to be special? Is there a point when you can let go of that? You know, just the phrase gifted program in this country shows you like where we are, but what's a good enough life? Is it okay? If, are you an art? Is it okay not to be an artist, to not have written your book? Is it okay to be a cook? to be a good mother. I mean, you know, so those issues really, I, when I wrote the book, The Ten Year Nap, actually, I had similar questions I realized um, about motherhood and work and this idea that people felt that they had to do something and why? Does it public opinion matter so much? So yeah, what's a good enough life? I think if you just throw that up in the air, it's like throwing a piece of meat at a pack of dogs. I mean, you ought to right. get something, at, you know, conversation going from that, I would think. Yeah, and it's so interesting just thinking about that, this idea that Jules, Jules is so obsessed with this idea of specialness and then she wonders if it's panning out for her. And then I think about this next generation of kids and how she has, like, you know, she, she's, she's cultivated something and then she has this child who is so special and who is so unself-conscious and then Ashton Ethan's kid is, one of, you know, their son is a disappointment in a lot of ways. Right. And just kind of what, that's so interesting also to think of, I would think for book clubs is, how does everything just change with that next generation? You can cultivate oh, yeah. everything so perfectly and then it just shifts. Oh, I know. I had a, when I was in first grade, I had this wonderful teacher who would invite me up to her desk to write short, to dictate short stories to her, and she would write them down because she could write a lot faster than I could. And she was sort of like, uh, I was sort of like a businessman, and she was like my executive secretary. I'd be like, take a letter, Mrs. Gerby, you know, like that. <laughs> but my mother saved them, you know, and I just love, I liked thinking about the teacher singling me out. We all want that moment, but the moment when you have to give that up. Um, is a very important moment. And, and you're writing the things not to impress other people. I feel like a lot of artists, and maybe it's not even just artists, whatever field you're in, you start out doing it for someone else. Mm. And that's a good way in to that advent calendar of whatever your life is. Doing it for someone else for a very long time. And then the moment you stop doing it and stop worrying about almost like aggressive specialness, mm -hmm. Aggressive specialness is very anxious, too. It's very anxious to have to be special, because what if you kind of screwed up? Like, what if I wasn't good tonight? Is that okay? You know? But I was, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, but to let go of that, I think, is, is tremendous, is so important. Because really, once you go beyond the idea of specialness, there's something much scarier, which is and I'm really not kidding now, which is like about death and about thinking about mm -hmm. the fact of, you know, you, the, the arc of your life, looking at your life and what you did and what lies ahead and what matters and um, being the best at something just isn't that. Mm -hmm. So, you know. We have time for one last question. Right over here. I, yeah, I want to say that uh, despite what the, you know, the readers who think the first 30% was slow, uh, one of my questions I had was, uh, it does, pull you in right away and engage you. And I thought it was never for a moment slow or untrue. And I wanted to know how, um, whether that takes a lot of editing or whether it's a natural thing for you. Uh, whether it's a natural thing to me to... The beginning, just the beginning is so engaging oh, and yeah. just kind of draws you in. So th those little words like, uh, like long evaporated that yeah. set a tone that it's lovely. For me, the opening of this book was, I always knew the opening. I mean, I, I knew it would take, like that wasn't gonna shift. That was sort of inviolable to me. Um, I saw these kids in this teepee and they sit around and they are, I, you know, every novel, every chapter of every novel is almost like a little concentrated version of what the whole book is supposed to be. Mm. So if you're writing, like every chapter, when you have a title, and I knew the title right away too, which really, really helped. I feel like books where you don't know the title of them for a while, it may be that you're not really sure what you're writing about. Um, mm. So the first chapter was very pleasurable to write. I wrote it in a big, long burst. I wrote it all the time. Uh, I have a lot of moments in there where I allow the characters to be kind of ironic and sort of obnoxious. There's this whole riff in there about, they're talking about these uh, European writers that they're reading, and, and of course, Jules, Julie, has never heard of any of them, and 
one of the one of the characters says, "I love Gunter Grass," and another character says, "You know, I love." You know, and Jules thinks if anybody asked her, she'd say, "Well, I love him too, but I haven't read as much of him as I would like." <laughs> and then somebody else says, "I love Anais Nin," and the boys groan. And then Ethan, my hero in the book, says, "Gunter Grass and Anais Nin." Both have umlauts in their name. That I'm going to get one for myself. And they're laughing and they're being pretentious and they call themselves the interestings. That set the tone. I wanted to do more and more of it. And I did. I indulged in it more and more and more. But you know what? When I revised, I did take out things that seemed to be spinning my wheels. But we live in this age now where I'm afraid that sometimes writers are told, get to the point. And fiction, the point, fiction sometimes has a soft and long point, you know, and I think that we ought to be able to stand up to those ideas. Sometimes what you love in fiction is not reaching, the, is not getting to the point, but the way, you know, so that novels really are about the path and the twisting path, and if you're, if it's engaging, even if it's not reaching a point, why not do it? Because it's showing the people in their fullness. It's giving that sense of what we call felt life. The first chapter, ended up being really, really long. I did cut it, I absolutely did cut it, but um, I, let it, I let it unfold in a way that was pleasurable to me. And it almost felt like, I guess it was sort of imitating the way that first summer unfolded for me when I was 15. So, thank you, and thank you, Molly, Aww. so much. Um, Meg, that was so wonderful. And, and everyone, Meg will be signing books um, right outside in the atrium.